I mean, in any case. Yeah, yeah. So we have already broadcasted, and people have started joining. Okay, so let's give them a couple of minutes, and then I'll start the introductions. Uh, Shilpa also <coughs> joined, Madhav. Yeah, yeah. Hi, ah, Shilpa. Good. Welcome. <coughs> Participants are coming in. Let's give them a minute to. Hi, Shilpa. Welcome. Yeah, hi, hi, Madhav. Uh, good evening. Hi, Shilpa. This is O.P. Agarwal, WRI. Good evening. Pleasure to meet evening. you. We'll go live. Uh, uh, of course. No, I'm just saying that we'll go live very soon. Uh, no, we are uh, live. We are, we are live, live, Madhav. Okay. okay. So, there are 46 so, people who have already joined in. So let's, let's get started. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for to everyone for joining this. Uh, I think it's in the current context an extremely important topic uh, that we'll be discussing. Really, issues around the informal economy and how do you set that you know back in order. Uh, we have a, a very interesting uh, panel that uh, will be talking to us on this. Uh, just to introduce the panel to begin with, uh, let me start with Mr. Shailaja Chandra. She was a career civil servant who's been uh, engaged with the public administration for nearly 50 years now. Uh, she was, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the first woman chief secretary of Delhi. I don't know if you've been the only one so far or whether there has been someone after that, the only chief secretary, woman chief secretary of Delhi. I've had the privilege of interacting with her at that time when she was the chief secretary. And uh, she's held uh, positions uh, in the national ministries of defense, power, health. She, in fact, retired as the secretary for health in the government of India. And in the States, she is, apart from Delhi, she's also worked with Goa and uh, with uh, Manipur and uh, uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, so that's, uh, she, you know, to her credit, she's a visiting fellow at the Shiv Nadar University and a recipient of the UNFPA Ladley Award for her opinion pieces on women's empowerment. So that is uh, Mrs. Shaila Jachandra. Uh, we also will have uh, uh, Mrs. Sheila Patel. She's, I think, having a little problem joining it. She'll be joining in any moment. Uh, Sheila is the founder and director of uh, something called the Society for Promotion of Area Resource Centers. This is an NGO working for over 35 years now on supporting community organizations of the urban poor. Uh, essentially, in their uh, efforts to access secure housing, uh, other basic amenities, and really get recognized uh, as city resident, getting the rights as city residents. So she's been very active in this field. We'll have the privilege of hearing her. Uh, we have uh, uh, Ms. Sheila Kumar, who just joined us a little while ago. And she provides overall leadership across the areas of digital ID, governance, citizen engagement, and property rights initiatives of the Omidyar Network. But prior to joining the Omidyar Network, she spent about three decades in the ICICI Bank Group and uh, spent most of her career working in the financial markets in building and shaping what is today uh, the ICI Bank's treasury and global markets business. She was the, till recently, the MD and CEO of ICICI Securities. I think that uh, speaks uh, a lot for her capabilities. She has been on the regulatory committees of uh, SEBI's Secondary Markets Advisory Committee and RBI's Technical Advisory Committee. She has also been on the advisory committees of the National Stock Exchange, the Bombay Stock Exchange, and the NSDL. Uh, she's an alumnus of... Uh, I am Calcutta. Uh, then we have Professor Amita Kundu. Professor Kundu is very well known in this field, in the whole uh, urban economics field. He's currently a distinguished fellow of the Research and Information Systems for Developing Countries. 
he chairs the committee on overviewing survey of the Swachh Bharat mission. This, as you know, has been a very important mission of the present government. And uh, he is uh, chairing that committee, which uh, over, overviewing this, uh, the rural component of the Swachh Bharat mission. He was a regional advisor to poverty on the UNSCWA uh, during 2017 and was a consultant to the government of Sri Lanka in 2014. In fact, uh, I have known him uh, for quite some time, primarily as a professor at the JNU, where he was till January 2014. He was the Dean of the School of Social Sciences and has also served as a member of the National Statistical Commission during 2006 and 2008. He's currently on the editorial board of a number of very important journals. This is the uh, uh, Manpower Journal, the journal called Urban India, the Journal of Educational Planning and Administration. And he has over 35 books and 300 research papers to his credit. That's Professor Amitabh Kundu. Finally, but uh, not the least, uh, Mr. Shashank Rao. Mr. Shashank Rao, he leads the trade union of uh, BEST, the Mehan Mumbai Electric Supply and Transport uh, Company. He's a graduate in sociology from the Mithibai College. And he became active in trade unions from 2015-16. In fact, he was largely instrumental in persuading Mumbai to increase the number of permits for auto rickshaws and taxi drivers. He also heads Mumbai's biggest hawkers union. That's Mr. Shachank Rao. Finally, our moderator for today is going to be Madhav Pai. Madhav is my colleague in WRI. He leads our entire cities program. Uh, Madhav has been uh, uh, a civil engineer who got his master's degree in transportation from uh, the Berkeley University in 1999-2000 was when he was at Berkeley. And uh, he has been with WRI now for about 15 years. He's the one who really started WRI India well before, uh, you know, he's the first person who really joined WRI in India. Began it right from scratch. So whatever it is today is really a lot goes to his credit. And he's been writing extensively on urban and infrastructure issues. In fact, he's well recognized in this field of infrastructure and, you know, particularly urban planning and urban transport planning more than anything else. So that's Madhav. So Madhav will be moderating the session today. The request to all of you is uh, to sort of keep your videos on so that participants can see you. We have about 105 participants at this point of time. And with this, let me pass it over to Madhav. Madhav, over to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Opie. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome again to all the participants. Uh, uh, just to quickly, how we'll do this, uh, I thought, I mean, uh, uh, we'll have uh, actually just uh, a view from couple of people who've been working very closely with these communities that have been most affected uh, affected in, in, in the last sort of month or last two months uh, in the context of COVID. So I'll ask Shashank to speak first and then Ms. Sheila Patel. And once that's done, uh, we'll ask Professor Kundu to provide an overview uh, in terms of sort of some of the macro numbers and statistics about, you know, the, the, the magnitude of the problem. And then, you know, we'll, we'll go to the speakers beginning with uh, Mr. Lala Sinda and Kumar, really talking about, you know, what, what can we do now, uh, given that, you know, this issue is so evident, obvious in front of us uh, to start tackling it systematically that, you know, as we go into this sort of post-COVID world, uh, you know, these people become a part of sort of the policy making, the decision making. Uh, the, and the choices we make on investing sort of public money in our spirit. So uh, without taking too much time, um, too much more time, I'm going to ask Shashank. Shashank, if you can take, say, seven, eight minutes and just, you know, I mean, <coughs> talk about, uh, you know, the, you know, talk a little bit about the auto rickshaw taxi drivers and the challenges they're facing and also about the street vendors. And, uh, and then we'll sort of kick it off from there. So over to you, Shashank. Thank you, Madhav. Uh, Mother, the situation with uh, auto and taxi drivers is very, very uh, grim. Uh, last almost three months, they have had uh, absolutely no income. And to sustain without an income is very difficult uh, and it's becoming difficult day by day. But today, uh, the position is that these people don't have money to uh, buy daily essentials also. So that is kind of a situation they are facing today. 
luckily uh, as far as the financial part of the loan that uh, they have taken for the vehicles goes uh, there is a mono, uh, moratorium given by the central government that would uh, i think uh, carry on till august but that's just a temporary uh, relief that they have they have to again repay the loan and uh, go on with things uh, uh, in a regular way but uh, today uh, there is a financial crisis and it has to be addressed because uh, there are two things one because a lot of these people are in slums so there is a fear factor uh, with regard to the covid uh, medically and uh, at the same time there is a major financial crisis now we are we have entered june uh, the schools would start probably uh, either in june or july uh, and again the entire cycle of money for fees money for uh, uniforms and so on and so forth so there is there's going to be a lot of uh, problems that these guys are going to face so this is the major uh, factors that we will have to focus on we had asked the government of maharashtra to provide each auto driver uh, rupees 10000 per month during the period of uh, lockdown so that he could take care of his family and there would not be any financial burden on him unfortunately nothing has been given till date and uh, these guys are absolutely uh, driven to the wall on the other hand uh, we have the street vendors and though a few of them especially how many auto rickshaw taxi drivers are there i mean uh, in in maharashtra there are around uh, nearing 16 lakh auto rickshaw and taxi drivers around uh, more than 15 lakhs auto rickshaw drivers and uh, somewhere to the tune of 70000 60 to 70000 are the uh, taxi drivers because taxi drivers are mainly concentrated in mumbai uh, they are not there in other parts of maharashtra but uh, with the auto drivers they are across maharashtra and uh, more than 15 lakh uh, auto drivers across maharashtra so uh, this uh, this is a huge uh, number of people that we are talking about unfortunately they have not got anything from the government as of now we are continuously uh, trying to persuade the government uh, to come and help them in some sort uh, but there has not been any help uh, till date whatever help has come like our union has uh, given food kits to a lot of drivers but that's not enough you need to give them uh, sufficient financial help so that they can carry on their uh, daily routine properly uh, with the street vendors uh, there has been a little business with the street vendors especially with uh, those who are dealing with uh, vegetables and fruits other than that all other street vendors have absolutely no business again for almost 3 months now so their capital is gone whatever capital they had it it is all uh, gone and now they are uh, again facing a situation where it is a blank slate uh, street vendors as we know uh, they are self employed rather more than self employed they self uh, help themselves put their money uh, do the uh, daily business and carry on and they are not a social uh, 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 kind of a social burden on anybody Uh, they are not burden on the society but now uh, if they are again not supported by the government the central government has given uh, instruction that these people should be given a loan of 10000 per head to start their business but i don't know how it uh, how they are going to do because uh, the major chunk almost more than 90 95% of these people are not registered or uh not considered as legal vendors so if they are not registered and they are not considered as legal vendors uh, i don't know how they are going to get the benefit of the central scheme so we are again facing a situation where uh, these people don't have money and they will not have money to start their businesses again so if they don't come back on their feet there is going to be a huge crisis and again uh, we, we are looking at uh, socio economic crisis here in in both these regards we are looking at a major socio economic crisis and i just and the numbers of these street vendors etc i mean again uh, again again almost almost on the lines of auto in maharashtra 
in mumbai we have more than uh, 3 lakh uh, street vendors uh, across maharashtra the number is around 11 lakhs so it is almost uh, it's lesser to the auto rickshaw drivers but uh, it it is uh, again a very significant number and that are most of the auto rickshaw drivers are probably domiciled in the state right whereas these vendors might be people from other states etc uh see they hail from other state but like uh, like the uh, auto rickshaw drivers who uh, are domiciled here because uh, it's the basic necessity to get a badge and the permit uh, to drive they may they may be natives of uh, other uh, states like bihar uttar pradesh or uh, karnataka or from anywhere uh, likewise even street vendors uh, the vendors that we are talking about major uh, uh, major chunk of the vendors are vending uh, in maharashtra or mumbai for about 30 years 35 years or even more than that because when uh, uh, when our union was fighting for them the first case that we had uh, one in the supreme court was in 1985 so from 85 till today even if you count these many years we are talking about 35 years and more so though they may be having their natives uh, again so whenever we talk about this migrant labor uh, mentioning uh, referring to referring to auto rickshaw drivers or taxi drivers or street vendors as migrants uh, does not sound uh, right because they have been uh, doing their business many of them own uh, major, uh, houses here or they have been renting houses here they have been uh, part of the socio economic system in the state of maharashtra yes sir just i mean i think since there is a question i'm going to ask you one last thing and then we'll move you know there is some talk about health insurance and hospitalization expenses for a lot of people can you just describe the situation of the bst drivers and the struggles that they are uh, 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 madhav uh, madhav the last time that we uh, spoke uh, on another webinar uh, i had told you that we were fighting for a 50 lakh uh, uh, insurance cover for their families uh, i'm very happy to say that after a good fight uh, for almost 20 days or more uh, we a uh, couple of days before we have been uh, uh, we have been granted that 50 lakh uh, insurance cover in case any of the employee uh, succumbs to the uh, to covid 19 uh, his family would get rupees 50 lakhs but other than that other than that there are major issues today i was just uh, before we could start i was talking to op agrawal uh, about this that uh, Uh, we have a heavy number of uh, positive infected uh, employees uh, we are almost touching 300 today so it's a very huge number that we are talking about and it is every day we are adding around 10 to 15 people uh, we have uh, 41 uh, employees have died till now so it's again a very huge number and unfortunately instead of providing them medical facilities uh the bst for last 20 days has stopped giving the number of people who are dying so the last number was at 8 20 days back and they have freezed there and the reason that they are given to the press or the media is that they don't want to create a panic among the employees by the rising number of deaths instead of that they should consider we have given them because a lot of employees major employees they struggle of getting beds in the hospital they are not getting proper treatment Uh, they are not getting icu beds when they want to because they are going with the general public so we have told the bst management that we have centers we have identified uh, centers within our own compounds uh, at wadala and dindoshi and similar and said ki you create independent facilities because bst itself every depot we have more than 24 doctors in bst employed with us so use them and uh, the nursing staff you could uh, bring on contract and start for our own employees because uh, we are uh, frontline workers here and now uh, when the lockdown is opening in mumbai uh, we will have a major problem because from the 8th the uh, commuters will increase the stress will increase the number of cases will increase so it's, it's going uh, to be a very chaotic uh, situation Thanks, thanks, Shashank. Uh, we'll come back to some of these points, and I think uh, you know some of these immediate needs of 
support that some of these people need uh, as they also sort of contribute to 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 sort of the to the to the, to going back to uh, work uh, Sheila, I'll come to the, you know if you can you know you've been working you said in a couple of wards uh, of mumbai especially around dharavi which is in the news everywhere uh, but also um, uh, uh, me east and other places so can you uh, just again like similar to shashank actually just to this audience sort of share the things that you are witnessing and uh, and and you know the, the grim situation and and just sort of what needs to be done immediately uh, to sort of at least address some of these issues i think you're on you're muted sheila so i think you'll have to unmute yourself sorry uh, shashank it's very good to meet you i know about your father's work but just yesterday i heard much more about what you're doing from madhav i think first of all i want to say that the real crisis of today's world is people who do not have any form of organizational identity because when you are a poor person and you do not have any voice or agency you are completely ignored so when you have traditional unions who have to fight 20 and 30 year battles in order to get minimum basic justice you can imagine the plight of people who live in slums and work in other informal work as self employed people uh, if you say in bombay uh, uh, it's between uh, uh, anywhere between uh, 50 and 65% people living in slums and you have now really dense locations where there are about 10 or 20 slums which are about 15 of them which are either the same size or bigger than dharavi in the airport for instance there are 98000 structures so what you have is more than half of the city facing covid infections because people sat in their taxis people were vending people bought things from them they were servicing the city and are now in terrible situations i don't want to repeat what he said but the fact is most people have not only finished all their capital uh, they have uh, no money every month the number of people who need to be fed food so they don't go hungry forget secondary vegetables and things are increasing and doubling and so what we find uh, for those of you who don't know uh, my organization works with a network of community federations and we work with the most vulnerable groups in the city with pavement dwellers with people who live along the railway track people who live along the airports on the port lands and of course now we work with dharavi and people who live in relocated slums after this. so all these people are going through a situation in which the face of the state is one of the police danda this is how poor people know the state if you try to get out of your house to get something before you get spoken to you get beaten uh, there are messages that the police give which is one there is a different message that the municipality gives one and there's a different message that the state government gives which comes on television and then gets retracted we've all seen that but i think the, the there are three other very important things that covid has done first of all it has forced us to acknowledge that we are going to face more and more unanticipated crisis and when we face an anticipated crisis and you have a state that does not bother to include you in its development investment then the burden doubles and triples so in informal settlements there is no water the sanitation is minimum and usually community toilets so the question of distancing and hand washing has become completely farcical then you have a situation in which uh the, the 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 manner in which you understand covid is changed uh first you were told that uh, if if there's somebody in your neighborhood who has covid you have to go for testing now even if your family has covid you will only get tested in a slum if you have fever 
that means you can be a non symptomatic carrier but that doesn't matter so that's one and the third very important thing is that in informal settlements there are a huge number of ongoing morbidities that make everybody vulnerable so if you look at the number of people who have uh, infectious other you know tb uh, other infectious diseases uh, blood pressure diabetes all these things which we know in cities have grown exponentially you become even more vulnerable so what we have found in the work that we do is wherever communities are organized wherever they function as a group their ability to separate fake news from real news their ability to go to their ward office and demand things their ability to access external support is very very different from those communities which have multiple leadership multiple political inference we find that when people are organized they make demands on their corporators on their mlas and mps they make sure that everybody gets food but the number who are like that are very few and we find the same thing in all other cities but in bombay this is terrible and the other thing which uh, shashank was saying is that we are no longer confident that the cases that are being uh, put out Uh, of infections of deaths of uh, uh, people who have been uh, uh, cured we no longer believe it because we see that the numbers that people are saying and the numbers that are told because now we have ward wise numbers they don't match so i think that's one big thing and we don't have any protocols you know you have who you have all these global institutions jumping up and down about covid there are no protocols that they ever considered for any form of disease for slums and in the global south every every country has large numbers of people living informally the other small piece of trivia that i want to give you is that in the climate change discussion there was a very interesting piece that said that although the amount of investment that was needed was much more than what uh, everybody thought they could put in but if you don't put that investment now you will have to spend to the ratio of 4 1 is to 4 and that's what we are doing now day as we speak dharavi has got a 130 bed uh, makeshift quarantine space near the snake garden it should have been done on day 1 but we didn't do it there are seven primary health centers in dharavi only one is working for 2 hours of the day so in a in the in this city which is supposed to have the best health and educational uh, programs for the poor are even what they have are not working so it's a very grim situation and it's not a short situation and yesterday we faced the cyclone which luckily didn't go as bad as we wanted but most of the informal settlements are not ready with their waterproofing which they do with plastic because the last two months when they had to do that there was everything was in lockdown and now they don't even have the money if it comes together so look at the volumes we are talking about of real serious assistance that is needed our government has borrowed 3 billion dollars for covid i want to know what is coming to people so i'll stop there you know there's one also since there's a live question just for you know there's a question about data and you know we spoke about this but there's a question about how can we build databases to direct funds in comes to migrate to these people and uh, you know so what's the best form should they now there be a database and some local police station so any thoughts on sort of this whole issue of data about you know these i think I that i i think that uh, any form of registered associations networks unions have to be brought into the picture to develop this process so if for instance shashank has a network of vendors he and other vendors associations have to be brought in to support it because the elite city completely depends on them however much they grumble and growl about it 
you know. So I think that's the same thing with waste pickers, same thing with bus drivers, same thing with food processors. You know, in all our informal settlements, there are huge businesses of, of all kinds, and there are associations. But those associations are not recognized, and there's an assumption de facto that it's all, uh, you know, it won't work. But I think it can be done transparently and well, and it can be monitored. And the other problem is that data, there is, you know, if you look at the amount of time that poor people answer questions that different people who collect data collect from them, we should, we should have a mammoth amount. But we don't have, the city doesn't have data. Uh, nobody has any information that can be processed to produce something which is useful. And certainly, despite the government saying civil society should help, there has been no, there's been no discussions. We have not been asked to come and give ideas or suggestions. And we believe that unless this is done in a systematic way, and we use COVID to organize communities and work on them, this process is going to keep coming back again and again because resilience cannot be done without organizing people. And, and the last thing which I want to bring in about migrants, have we forgotten our constitution? Every Indian has a right to move anywhere to earn for life and livelihood. So why are we grumbling about interstate migration? In Maharashtra, the construction businesses can't work unless the migrants come back. There are people who are trying to fly their migrants who have run away back. They didn't think of giving them food and shelter when they were here. So I'm saying there's an irony in all this, but there's also a silver lining. And I think that we have to talk about that before we have another meltdown when all this lockdown comes out and we have more spikes and more fearfulness and stuff like that. Thanks, thanks a lot, Sheila. We'll come back to your optimism. <laughs> it's not end. optimism, it's desperation. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, no, 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 absolutely. It's about what we can do uh, yeah. with, with this opportunity, really, to make things slightly better, at least. Yeah. Uh, Shashank, there are some questions for you in the chat box, so if you're able to ask access it and answer that will be great. Now I'll ask Professor Kundu to share his presentation where he has developed these macro numbers to talk about how many people are there that are really in, impacted uh, across, across India. So Professor Kundu, I'm going to share my screen and share the presentation and uh, uh, you know, just uh, over to you. Thank you, Madhav and Dr. Agarwal for the privilege to participate this Build Back India Better webinar series as a part of, if I am permitted to say, WRI India research team. My first position that I would like to mention is that whenever you talk about the migrants, international, interstate migrants or informal sector, the images that come to us as the women and children with head loads walking on the roads, railway tracks, and huddled in trucks, and crowded buses. But certainly, we have to distinguish between the vulnerable interstate migrants and the other migrants. Similarly, when you talk about informal sector, we generally think about those categories that Shashank was talking about or Sheila was talking about. And I think that's far more important. So when you look at interstate migrants or the informal sector, the first responsibility of the researchers is to work out a methodology and identify the database which are relevant for the policy intervention, for making the cities better, for really separating out the vulnerable interstate migrants from the other migrants. And I would like to, the first slide that you have, it clearly shows a very shocking reality that the migrants are much better off, particularly the male migrants and then the non-migrants, because most of us who are in the webinar are migrants, you know. So 
if, if you talk about interstate migrants, even they are much better than the non-migrants. Look at the manufacturing sector. The share of the migrants is far better in the urban areas and rural areas. I put with red mark is much better than the non-migrants. Con you know, construction is a low level activity. There it is less, but trade and services, modern services, public services, the share of migrants is much higher. Look at the next one. It shows the level of education. You find the migrants have a much higher level of education in the urban areas compared to the non-migrants. Graduates and above, higher secondary and above, you find migrants have a much larger share than the non-migrants. Please go to the next one. You find, I'll just quickly go over the slide. You find classification of the migrants and non-migrants by the expenditure category. And you do find that at the higher level, the percentage of migrants are having a larger proportion, more than rupees 1,500 per, per capita, the percentage of migrants are much higher. Basically, the point that I want to make that for policy interventions to focus on the vulnerable sections of the population, it is extremely important that we identify the four vulnerable, distressed, and dispossessed sections within the sector rather than taking interstate migrants and informal sector as one category. Please go to the next one. Now, as I mentioned that within the informal sector also, there are huge inequality. I go to a village, I find somebody selling coffee in a village. That person is also a, 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 a migrant. On the other hand, a doctor, uh, a lawyer, and uh, somebody running a you know, coaching class earning thousands of rupees is also the, in the informal sector. I think that is something that the policymakers and specifically the researchers who are working on these issues must bring it out. Tragedy. When we were announcing the first lockdown, we didn't realize that the social distancing does not mean the same thing for different sections of the population. For the upper and the middle class, social distancing really helped. It helped in spreading the coronavirus. But immediately, as, as Sheila was pointing out, social distancing in the slums, they can't get out of the slums because they get bitten up and they're using the common toilet. 47% of the Mumbai population lives in one room per four persons per room. So obviously, the lockdown increased the congestion and ghettoization. Unfortunately, the government. Do they have the data on how many people have moved from one district to the other, other districts of the country? Do we have the data? Yes, we do. In fact, census has collected the information for each district, how many people have moved to different districts. But look at this tragedy. All that we have is for 2001 census. I've been trying to get the data for 2011. There is no reason why that data could not be released. This is the graph which has been used by the, even the Ministry of Urban Development in the latest you know, reports, which really uses the data for 2001 census, showing that the out-migrating districts are partly, largely from you know, Eastern Uttar Pradesh. One or two districts are also from Western UP, Bihar, Midnapur and Purulia in West Bengal, and uh, Kalahandi area uh, in, uh, in Odisha, and some parts of Rajasthan and also in Gujarat. But this data should have been available to the government on 25th of March 2020, when they were planning the movement. Go to the next one. This, this, is, uh, this is the total number, and this is giving the percentage of the inter district migrant migrants going from one district to other. This information I have been struggling to get into the public domain for, from at least 2011 census. That would have helped the policy makers much uh, better than using 2011 data. Please go to the next one. I want to quickly go over that. Now, you find at the state level, we have the figures. We have the figures of out migrants. You find uh, shown with red light, Uttar Pradesh has the highest, largest share of out migrants. This is from 2007-8 NSS data. That's the latest that we have available. Uh, that shows 18%. But census data shows that Uttar Pradesh claims 23% of the total out migrants. Next comes Bihar, about 14%. Please go down. Are you? If you go down further, Rajasthan is also having a high share. You please go down. You find Odisha, although it's an out-migrating state, the total share in the out-migrants 
is something like 3.99%, which is not much higher than the population share. In fact, the census share in the out-migrants uh, is even less than the population share, which comes at the last column. But Odisha, although the total number of migrants are not very large, but they are the poorest among the out-migrants, and that's why their you know, conditions and suffering were in the forefront. Madhya Pradesh is another state. Maharashtra, although it is an in-migrating state, the percentage of share of out-migrants is also very large because of the inequality within Maharashtra, and Andhra Pradesh is also having a high, high share. These are the share of different states, and that data is certainly available, but only for 2007, 8, and 2011. So the challenge that, that I accepted to work out the latest figure, and I will just quickly give you how we can arrive at the methodology and also the data on the number of, uh, you know, migrants and the informal sector who got dispossessed as a result of the COVID-19 who needed to be transported back to their places of origin. I just quickly tell you the methodology and the rough figures. This is the share in in-migrants. This is the in-migrating state. Punjab is an in-migrating state. The share in the interstate migrant is about 5%, international migrant share is 6%, although their share in population is about 5%. Delhi is a hugely in-migrating state, having much larger percentage of interstate migrants and international uh, migrants than the population share. Uttar Pradesh is slightly, it's receiving interstate migrants also because of the inequality, uh, but the figure is 9%, which is slightly higher than their population share, because UP is a large state. Please go down quickly. Now you find Maharashtra is receiving about 17% of the total interstate migrants. So that is the largest receiving state and Gujarat. We have at the state level the figures and I'll just quickly tell you how I estimated the figures for the vulnerable interstate migrants and vulnerable uh, informal sector workers. These are the graphs of migrants coming from different districts the, uh, and the share of the total seasonal migrants going to visit the destination districts are given here. And unfortunately, this is not the actual real data because the data is not available. There's a professor, Professor Clement Imbert, who is a very known expert on India. He has used 2001 census data. Think about it, 2001 census data with some probabilistic model as distributed and tried to identify the districts which are in migrating districts and the district which has sent out the migrants. And I find that the probabilistic model gives the distribution somewhat all right, but this certainly does not match the real situation that I try to derive. So I certainly think there's a dire necessity of you know, uh, the government releasing the data for 2011. And also, as I was discussing with Dr. Shailaja Chandra, having some kind of official information system about uh, reporting so that the government can use that database in the times of crisis. This table shows the vulnerability of different states, the percentage of households who do not have tax. This is only for the urban area. You find in Maharashtra, 42% of the total households Imagine, this is urban Maharashtra, 42% of the total households live in one room unit and the average occupancy is four plus. Similarly, you find in West Bengal, 42% of the people live in one unit in the urban areas of Calcutta. So what does social distancing mean for them? Similarly, number of households who do not have taps in Tamil Nadu is 48%, West Bengal is 47%. And imagine this number of toilets who are using common toilets. Not only they're standing in the queues for in the morning, but also using the same you know, facility. So that in that situation like that, 42% in Greater Bombay, I'm not talking about slums. This is the total urban uh, municipal corporation area showing very high percentage of household depending on community toilets, toilets, and also the percentage of slum population is much higher. Please go down. Uh, Professor, if you can wrap up now quickly. I'll, I'll, I'll just give you the methodology and we'll finish uh, there itself. I'm, I'm trying to rush through. Again, you have one room dwelling units, uh, sharing a couple, not having a, a, a exclusive room. Please go to the next one. This is 
Now, proposing a methodology of working out the number of vulnerable informal sector population and within the interstate migrants, how many of them have lost their job? We have from PLFS, this is a periodic labor force survey data, the regular wages and salary person. And we find that among those who have reported having regular wage and salaries in 2017-18, 49% of them do not have any social security. To say that all regular and salaried workers are having social safety uh, net this is absolutely absurd. 49% do not have that. We take that out as vulnerable who have either lost their job or are likely to lose their job. Casual wage workers, we have again the data for the urban areas for 2017-18. 88% of the total casual wage workers are not having any social security. So you add it up, you find, uh, and as far as the self-employed are concerned, there is no information on whether they have social security or not. So what we did is to calculate the number of persons who are actually not having social security from the regular salaried workers. Very easy methodology. We find among the regular workers, how many of them do not have social security? We found a large number, as I said, 51% do not have social security. What is their wages? And anyone in self-employment category having less than that wage is considered to be vulnerable. Please go to the next one. So we calculated among the self-employed, the state level figures that how many self-employed are economically vulnerable by that standard. Please go to the next one. We find the percentage of employees who are not having social security among the self-employed, please go down further, is something like about among the self-employed, 62% do not have any social security. We add that up and please go to the next one. This is the railway data. We know how many people move in different months. In November, December, the people who go back to the rural areas are 2 million, but in March, April, May, June, about 4 million people. These are the, you know, short duration migrants who travel back and forth. So about 4 million people would have liked to go back in March, April, who could not go because of this. The last slide here, we have done the calculation. The total interstate migrants are 72 million. And out of the 72 million, 26 million are in regular employment, 13 are in casual employment, and 4 million are in self-employment. Now, what we do, is to calculate the vulnerable regular workers, vulnerable casual workers, and vulnerable self-employed on the basis of the data from NSS and population census. And we find that the percentage of migrant workers not having social security is 50% among regular workers, 95% among casual workers, and 60% do not have social security among self-employed. Please go to the next one. Please go to the next one. Now we calculate the total number of interstate migrants who are in informal sector and are vulnerable are 16 million plus 6 million. The short duration migrants, the total number of persons about 22 million who needed to go back. Out of them, my rough estimate is about 13 million, 13 to 14 million have either traveled back by very unsafe modes or have traveled by the shramic expresses. At the moment, about four to five million would not like to go back, but certainly five to six million still would like to go back. That's a rough kind of a calculation. And district to district uh, origin destination data is easily available with the government from 2011 census. That should be used in addressing situations of this crisis. Sorry, Madhav, I took slightly longer time. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kundu. So, you know, I mean, I think now we're at a point where we've sort of understood the challenges uh, the, the people have been facing, uh, uh, both from Shashank and uh, from Sheila. And now Professor Kundu has sort of laid out uh, the, the sort of the, the extent or the sort of size of the problem in some way, or the size of the challenge. So now let's now take the rest of the to talk about sort of what possibly can be done in this context. Uh, uh, and, you know, not just say in the short term, in the next three months, but also as we sort of, I think, hopefully get back to normal, 
you know what can be done that we don't get into a situation etc like this again so uh, what do you uh, miss uh, shalaga tanda and i mean you know you've had a long experience of working uh, 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 as a public servant in uh, in the civil services so from your perspective you know what can be done what needs to be thought about uh, so that you know uh, we are much better as we sort of emerge out of this whole situation so i think that the situation we are in is uh, not only pathetic but it is hazardous and successive governments over decades have gone along with this idea that poor people can descend at a railway station or at a bus stop and just go and uh, you know crash into another room which has already 10 people in it with a mama or a chacha or somebody and then go ferreting for some petty menial work and work your way upwards and governments have tolerated it for various reasons the first is that these people are unseen because they are not straight away vote banks they are not people who have voting rights second is the issue that it just seems to be such a huge problem and people are somehow willing to be taking care of their livelihood or their lives so why should government get into it it is beyond the municipal corporation and it is beyond any kind of uh, you might say state level uh, government uh, intervention so you have a situation as in delhi and i'm familiar with delhi so i'll speak of that i mean you have a situation of about 2 and 1/2 million slum dwellers and then unauthorized colonies urban villages uh, resettlement colonies uh, all together there are about 10 million out of a population of 20 million now out of these it is much more uh, it's much easier to woo as voters the lobby which is the unauthorized colonies because they have already built up something and they have a stake in living on whether they become guards or drivers or whatever the slums have two kinds of people those who have actually been long term the guy who works in my house comes from one of the biggest slums near uh, the colony i live in and over there he came 35 years ago from bundi district in rajasthan he had four children they studied here two went back two are here one cuts marble and the other um, does some i think um, uh, construction you might say uh, uh, masonry work these people have over the years acquired their jugis they have or you might say government has connived with the idea that they can construct two stories now three stories no matter that this delhi is in a seismic zone and the idea is i offered my man i said please i'm giving you this example because it will hit you in the face what's happening uh when i asked him why can't you move in with your wife into the servant quarter i'll give you he said no way because my jukki will be usurped by somebody and i have a stake in that jukki because either i will be in developed in situ and i will get a regular flat or i will get land in lieu this is too precious an investment for me to give it up and go and move somewhere else so there is a huge stake in staying on they have their own let's not call them slum lords they are like the slum panchayat pradhans and everything i mean even the hafta is paid to that guy and then flying the police and flying the other municipal authorities and all for all kinds of looking the other way kind of measures goes on now we say poor migrants and yes what is poor is that the constitution gives them the right to settle anywhere but the constitution under that section article along with it is a proviso a very strong proviso subject to such reasonable restrictions as the state will impose no state has imposed any such restrictions because it is something which is beyond them in the name of getting the cheap labor in and ultimately contract labor comes in industrial disputes act comes in and about 44 labor laws come in nobody wants to be under the labor laws 
if you don't want to be under the labor laws, then you are out of sight, out of mind. The minute you are not covered by a law or a statute, you are just an animal who can be tossed around in any way. Whereas my heart bleeds for those people, unless you look at the totality of it, why is it not happening in such large numbers in other countries? The reason is because, and one municipal, municipal commissioner tried to do it in Delhi, you must ask a new person, you must tell the Pradhan of the slum, any new person coming in, because they, they, the slum is divided into camps in Delhi. Camps have about 300 households. So it's a manageable amount. In the 300, if one new person comes and the Pradhan doesn't report, it becomes then a case for criminal action because you have to see that basics are made available. You may be giving drinking water through tankers, you may be giving free electricity, those are not basics. Basics is also sanitation, not having pollution, not having a bad ventilation to the point that children are getting respiratory problems. These are things which have to be overseen and nobody is doing it. They will not do it unless there is a requirement under law. And the requirement under law does not get into the habitation. It gets into health. It gets into livelihood. It gets into oversight of drinking water, toilets when they are working. It does not get into the habitation. And had there been a work permit, it would have been possible to do it. Now, let's go back. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say five things and please bear with me. Number one, under the constitution, which is the mother, mother um, document under which everything comes. You cannot talk of migrants and poor and slumming and poverty, nothing till you look at the constitutional position of an individual within that. And the constitution says you can go and settle anywhere subject to reasonable restrictions. What stopped the government from saying that the reasonable restriction would be that there cannot be more than five people in one room. There cannot be a place which does not have a, um, a community toilet which is being accessed and the sewage taken away, which, does, which, which has various basic things and av availability not of uh, Jola Chap doctors. All these fellows go to Jola Chap doctors, they get steroid injections put. They do not go to your Chinmaya mission or your Arya Samaj. Why don't they do that? Because it means half a day's dhari gone. Half a day's dhari is too precious for them. They would rather get a steroid injection and be on their feet and pay 50 rupees, 100 rupees for it. They're young and therefore they're able to withstand it. You and I would not be able to. Now, Coming back to the constitution, the next thing is your 44 labor laws. All these labor laws have never, ever been implemented with any sincerity. And I can tell you throughout my long career, which OP referred to, I would definitely say that when postings and transfers are done, when the man gets a good job or a bad job, labor is considered the pits. Nobody wants to go to the labor department. And it is considered to be a department where you can go from shop to shop under the Shops and Establishment Act and you can make money. It is not seen as a welfare thing. Second is you have something called, what are they called, the Construction Workers Welfare Board. This is for construction workers. What about others? If they are vendors, whether they're anything, is there a welfare board for them? Who is administering that board? How much of that money is going back? This is also a law. Now, you go back to these 44 laws. Presently, they have been put into four codes. They have gone to a parliamentary committee. And the parliamentary committee is going through various motions of whether the codes are OK and whether it will all come to the parliament. It will have to get passed. In the meantime, the chairman of that standing committee has raised the issue in um, the standing committee on 20th of May, I'm told, in which he has said, how have states done away? Some of the states are, uh, I mean, sort of doing away with some of these labor laws. Now you might say on the one hand, the labor laws are preventing the growth of industry. That is true. On the other hand, the law requires that if you have more than, I think it is 15 people on your role, and you are a subcontractor, subcontractor, 
you have to do certain basic things. Otherwise, the main employer, the company that kept you has to pay. Nobody is looking at all this. So in all this rigmarole that is going on, rather than think of so many things which should be done here and now, which should be done, money must go into their pockets. They must not, they must be uh, treated humanely. I think what I said in an article in the Indian Express and which I would like to reiterate, number one, the reasonable restrictions have to be imposed. Otherwise you will have a free for all and that is not because you're a citizen and don't have a right to move, but you should be able to carry with you portable way the ration card that you had, the election card that you had, and you continue to be able to use those cards to draw the security and the uh, support that a normal ration card holder, like my guy who gets ration and he came 35 years ago does, but others who are coming probably now don't, and they never get thought of in the next election. So one is this question of reasonable restriction. Second is the question of making the labor laws far more, I mean, to reform them in a way that it doesn't suppress industry. Today, too many are in the micro sector. Nobody wants to move out of the micro sector because they don't want the sort of democracy that that labor law puts on you. That is also ridiculous. It's also ridiculous that we never implement those laws. So what are we talking about? You're scared of a law because somebody will come hammering and taking money from you. But the law is itself never implemented. Now, I think that registration in a simple way, not in an exploitative way, and I thank Dr. Kundu because when I wrote the article, I sent it to him and he guided me. He says, don't just say registration. It can lead to huge exploitation. Talk about registration without exploitation and their ways of doing it. People have even suggested it can be done on a simple SMS. But unless government has numbers, unless government has data, they can never plan for money, for food, for any kind of thing. So they must be, the labor department is not the department for this, nor is social welfare the department for this. This has to be thought through in terms of the welfare of people who are without a security umbrella. Anybody who does not have a security umbrella, migrant is today's word. It's not migrant. Anybody who is working over there, he's contributing to the GDP. He's doing something good for your state. Your industry can't do without him. Your construction cannot do without him. You must be able to provide certain basic things under the law. And to oversee this numbers and data is essential. And if it is my neighbor who is constructing his house, where it's about 10, 12 um, uh, poor people are just, you know, carrying bricks and cement, he also is liable to be registered, the contractor. He's not registered. He says the plumber is somebody else, the carpenter is somebody else, the mason is somebody else, so he gets out of that news. I think there's something radically wrong till we make the people who are using the migrants responsible for taking on this kind of, you might say, being responsible for giving a certain element of the security and government for giving the remaining part, which is PDS and things like that, and to be able to have a head count of these people. I'll say just one more thing before wrapping up. You know, when the Delhi government faced this problem of um, COVID and all these people before they started going away, uh, I used to get data and I used to ring up officers who have worked with me who were kind enough to share it with me. And they said, Madam, I have the figures right from 27th of March daily, how many meals were being given? Lunch, dinner, what was the quality of food? What was being given? How many NGOs were working? How many was being done in the schools through cooking like midday meals? All this data, which meant in a day, two million people were being fed. So I asked them, how many of them were ration card holders and how many of them were non-ration card holders? They said, but we don't keep this data. This proves my point. If you don't keep this data, how can you ever think of doing anything? You cannot look after one man and two men. Government has to look after millions. To look after millions, you have to have a policy, you have to have a law, and you have to have mechanisms for implementation. Till now, it was completely nobody's business. Cheap labor came, contractors were happy, 
bigger employers were happy, industry was happy, and everything was to hell with them, what they do in their dharavis and what they do in their uh, different uh, mallards and uh, cars or wherever they stay. It's fine. Just let them stew. We are getting cheap labor. And the, the, the attitude of any employer is just the same. How can I minimize my expenditure? How can I drive up my profit? It is for governments to oversee that that exploitation does not take place. And having 44 laws put into four codes and still giving it to the same labor departments of the state governments to implement, it's not going to achieve very much. So this is what I wanted to say, putting it in some sort of a perspective. And thank you very much. And I think this sort of this, the legal perspective on this comes very important. Uh, Sheila had a specific, Sheila, did you have a question for Professor Kundu or did you want to say something before we go to Sh Shilpa? Uh, but you know, if you have a quick uh, point to make or a question, please, uh, you can. Uh, I think she's still muted. Uh, Chilpa, why, why don't you, you know, uh, you, you know, you work in supporting organizations like ours and others that have been using, uh, you know, technology and other platforms to sort of, you know, okay, help I'm with on. some of these. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll answer after that. Sure. I was on uh, with, uh, sure, sure. So with, uh, the, you know, to help with these challenges around urban governance, etc. So just wanted to hear sort of your thoughts on some of the organizations that you support uh, and whether some of your ideas have changed. I, I know you ran a, a sort of a program where you were uh, providing funds for some uh, young organizations that had ideas to help with the challenges that are occurring. So just wanted to hear your perspective, what you were seeing, and uh, based on also what has been said previously, uh, do you think, uh, you know, this kind of sort of knowledge and input would be valuable to bring to some of the entrepreneurs that you work with uh, so that you know they're able sure. to better design products and things like that. So over to you. Yeah, no, thanks, Madhav. Thanks for that. Uh, so just, uh, you know, quickly, let me first say a, a line about Omidya Network. I'm not sure most people might be familiar with uh, us. So we are uh, the philanthropic capital of uh, Pierre Omidya. Uh, and uh, we work in India with the mission statement of trying to make life meaningful for every Indian. Uh, that's really the mission statement with which we work. Uh, I, I, you know, typically the areas we've been doing a lot of work and especially for the vulnerable, uh, you know, communities and people in what we call the next half billion. Uh, we really do a lot of work in the space of urban governance, property rights, digital identity. Uh, and uh, I must, uh, you know, share with you a couple of things. So first, uh, you know, there were, I, I think for the country as a whole, there were two significant learnings, uh, particularly to do with the cities uh, of our country. Uh, and I think the first learning that uh, was, you know, very crystal clear is when one out of two people who live in the city uh, are people who live in the city's slums. Uh, and the fact that, you know, COVID has highlighted how the symbiotic nature of the city really puts at risk not just uh, the 50% which lives in the slums, but it puts, uh, you know, in, into question uh, the way the entire city is structured, I think that has very starkly been brought out by the COVID crisis. Uh, I think the second thing that, you know, was a very big learning, and I mentioned to you earlier, we, we do a lot of work in the area of uh, identity and welfare benefits. Uh, so we actually had a survey across 15 states in the country where we reached out to 25,000 below poverty line families. Uh, to check how welfare benefits were reaching them. Uh, well, Madhav, there was good news as well. The good news is that for below poverty line families, a lot of the welfare benefit could reach in a fairly targeted way to almost between 80 to 90% uh, of the, uh, the population, below poverty line population. But I think also what it highlighted is that there was a very big gap in terms of where welfare benefits would not reach at all. And 
it turns out that this gap really is to do with the informal worker in the city and i think you know uh, all the panelists earlier kind of highlighted uh, the fact that you know because these are people who are away from their area of domicile uh, the the fact of the matter is they are also you know the the really aspiring part of india's population they are the entrepreneurs the micro entrepreneurs uh, you know the street vendors so these are people who are in the city to earn livelihoods who are the aspiring population and yet when covid hit they went from being people who were earning uh, at times maybe above yeah, poverty line sure. incomes to suddenly people who earned nothing uh, so can you hear me mother yes yes absolutely Thank yeah you. so so th- these were the two big learnings that you know we had and uh, therefore when we launched our rapid relief fund which was a 10 crore fund to actually target you know people who were able to quickly uh, offer relief uh to communities that required relief uh, one of the things we realized is that this community of informal workers in the city was the hardest to access so uh, since you know covid started we spent a bit of time doing a, you know a little bit of uh work in this area and and uh, there are you know number of learnings and i just want to highlight them and how we are thinking about the future Uh, i think the first is and highlighted by everybody ahead of me on the panel is the absence of data so if you really want to you know work with these communities there is a you know near absence of data the data you have is very very old data so that's the first thing we realized uh, i think the other thing you know and very interesting learning out of our property rights work is the fact that you know because housing is such a problem so people come for livelihoods but they have actually no uh, 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 what would i say uh, you know housing which has dignity in a sense housing which allows dignity uh, allows dignified access to services um, and and that actually seems to be also a very big you know issue uh, that that really needs uh, you know tackling uh the whole area in terms of uh, remittances because a lot of people need to send money back home uh, they need credit to fund what they are doing and these are all areas in which we have experimented we have actually funded entrepreneurs in these areas and uh you know let, let me let me you know conclude by saying that uh, while we would very much like to stay engaged in this space and we would look to work with Uh, uh both academic think tanks in terms of you know what policy level solutions are possible we'd also love to work with entrepreneurs in this space whether uh, they be you know social entrepreneurs civil society organizations to look for solutions but but i want to you know end with a little bit of an example uh, in terms of how we think and i i want to you know go to orissa where our property rights team had actually worked uh you know with the government of orissa to actually uh you know give people who lived in slums some kind of uh, uh you know informal title to the places in which they lived uh which resulted in people actually investing in those houses making them pakka houses instead of you know the kacha houses that they lived in uh and when we looked back just recently after the cyclone that hit uh, you know orissa Uh, one thing that gave us a lot of satisfaction is people who had invested in these houses and strengthened their houses were much more protected uh, against even the cyclone uh, that happened uh, so you know that's the kind of i guess uh, optimism with which we'd like to you know engage in work in this area uh, certainly it's one which calls for a lot of attention uh, thank you madam thank you uh, and you know i mean now that we've had one round and uh, Shina, you had raised your hand, so you can certainly see. But what I'll do is I'll also sort of read out two or three first round of questions that have come, and if any one of you wants to respond to that, uh, uh, you know, we can do. So we can do. So far, you know, one question is, uh, you know, how do we initiate creating a database of migrants? We briefly spoke about it, but basically, how can government start to engage various stakeholders? As I mean, how does government go about engaging with the? organizations that are in place like labor unions other community groups and things like that is there a systematic way uh, in which that could be done so that's one question 
there is a question about uh, you know once the database is created shouldn't ids like aadhar or can't ids like aadhar be the ba basis for benefits of transfer of pds insurance etc and not factors like domicile and originating state uh, so is that something that uh, uh, you know that 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 possible and i'm just reading out these questions these have come from uh, there is one question is on the fact that and this probably goes to shashank uh, with small businesses shut currently there would be a rise of street vendors and other informal occupations so should licenses quotas be done away with altogether and you know many informal sector workers will not be registered with any association so you know what's the way to organize for them and and then sort of this whole question and you know was you know shilpa maybe you can now that if the contours of creating a safety net is been done uh, you know you mentioned that housing is one clear area but what about some ideas around direct cash transfers or welfare scheme uh, uh, that uh, you know uh, also if you can talk a little bit about the nature of solution that uh, uh, receive the omidyar grant and anything you find very promising at this moment so maybe we can start with you and then we'll go to others uh, uh, with some of these questions so yeah yeah so you know um, um, i i think the in, well the interesting challenge over here is that this seems to be the intersection of many different levels of complexity so the first thing actually we tried doing a little work on uh, is you know the bocw fund because there was 35 to 50000 crore of funds available for relief if people could access it and there were a number of you know very different you know issues i mean of course there were labor laws which came in the way of registration and because there was no registration you could not direct direct uh, you know bocw funds for relief on the other hand you know it's very clear that uh, where uh, states are able to get registration done uh, cash relief has been the fastest and best way of reaching uh, vulnerable communities so i i think certainly the whole you know a complex and knotty issue of uh, registration and formalization of contracts and how we kind of try and you know square that circle i think that certainly becomes a uh, very very important matter and that's something we would also uh, try to engage with you know uh, think tank policy uh, practitioners uh, to try and reach some solution thank you Sheila, you want to say something now, Mina? I have to say a lot of things. A lot of things. First of all, I think we all have to have a, a much more twenty-first century concept of understanding urbanization. Huh? The reality is, you can do what you want. The global economic order is going to push for urbanization because it's going to push people out of rural areas. so whatever images people have that people should go back there are a lot of discussions to kundu and i were in another webinar where people were saying government was saying oh we'll we'll increase the nreg and we'll push people there and then the data found out that it doesn't work like that so first of all it's got to be clear that more and more people are going to be moving into cities and many cities are go many urban areas are going to be produced where people live because of the change of occupation we already have 2000 look uh, set places which should be called urban in the last census but remain rural because the government does the state government doesn't give the gr to make it urban so what happens is that you have larger groupings of people living together but do not have the urban basic services that you need so that's one the second thing is that people don't people come into cities to work if you are you are a specialist in transport you know that the minute a transportation facility is affordable people live along those spaces people don't want to live in the center of the city they want to live near a transport hub where they can go to work our cities are yeah our cities are designed still in the colonial fashion so that's the second thing the third thing is that there's this another colonial thing about who has land uh, nobody half of the people who who say they own land 
if you go into the details of it they were given that they, they were given that land to do something else they did something else and they are still the land owners and so today the only way poor people can get land is by squatting you don't change anything they will squat and the reason people will not come and stay in your home is because after they stop working for you they again have to go and buy land so there's a market for slum housing it's not as if it's all squatting and mm. there again the reason why there are these agents and mafia and touts is because there is no governance structure that the state has bothered to produce that works for poor people in those locations finally the same thing is with database there is no shortage of poor people's data being collected time and again professor kundu can get the census data of 2011 next year we are supposed to have another census what is the use of doing that 150 cities were mapped uh, 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 for slum structures you go to any city you won't find that data and if they find the data it is useless. so how do you get live data has not yet been managed and finally what i want to say is that informalization is the reality today and it's going to grow it's not going to get less so how are we going to deal with that how are we going to produce organizations that allow these these collectives to represent there's such a deep fear of even formal uh, uh, unions everybody is trying to break down formal unions how are you going to facilitate networks of vendors and home based workers and uh, all the other people and finally you talk about things the construction workers and the bd workers the construction workers we found out at least 4 years ago i had 5000 crores that was put in the form of cef same thing with bd workers nothing of that has gone to the the community so what's the point of government collecting all this money because it never spends it so there are lots you know the thing is we are stuck in urbanization because we do not understand urbanization in the present context and in the future context and therefore if we are not able to plan cities the planning planning instruments are 19th century planning instruments so i think you know to to try and think that we can change something by just tweaking a little bit here and there's not going to happen till so, i just a question for you quickly yeah, if you can respond okay. and yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. so you know if what should be the demand you know if the migrants have are asked what should be their demands for coming back to the city with two three things that you know uh, uh, that come you know this is one of the questions i'm just uh, posing it to you but you know if any two or three ideas that you could articulate around this and if that could be sort of I developed i think people who know different sectors will give different things so for instance uh, because we are involved in housing infrastructure uh, a lot of the urban poor that i know at some point or the other have worked in construction now if you take construction you take uh, small uh, textile industries you take the food the food industry uh, you take all these aggregators of all these people who are uh, uh, working for from amazon to the local food people there there is at the moment no aggregation that allows them to seek something in the absence of a national policy that says that everybody is entitled to this uh, you know whether it's health or it's social security or it's insurance we keep hearing all these things but then when i go to the health mission it's rural nreg is rural so if you look at you you look at the urban population you'll have very little or no Uh, access to even what is announced like many of the speakers have said so i think even those of us who are actually working with these communities we find that even if they are informally aggregated as we do with slum dwellers pavement dwellers everybody and we produce our own data that challenges the state data 
That's how the negotiations begin. But on the other side, we need people who understand urbanization. The challenge is that the larger understanding of what is happening in urbanization and how more and more people have to come into cities is not being looked at. And the last thing about migrants that I want to say is that international and global institutions talk about diaspora investment and how they bring more money than foreign direct investment. We are not looking at the amount of money that urban families, even three or four generations living in the city, contribute to the rural economy through their remittances, formally sent, informally sent. And we incorporate all that in the understanding of what we do. So I think, but so we are all planning through our networks, informal or otherwise, to get everybody a bank account, to aggregate the volumes of people who need something, to demonstrate, like Omidyar said, through, uh, sometimes through philanthropy, sometimes through formal institutions, to get, to start this business of saying that the poor have the first right on the state. And we demand that that be explained because most of us, actually don't even, the poor people don't even know that they have a right to that entitlement. Every, even when the state and the MLA gives money, gives a food parcel, it's treated like charity. So those are the things we all have to change. And I think COVID brings all of us uh, who, are, who don't talk to each other because we work in different silos together. We need to maintain this. We need to share the things we are able to do. Uh, we are planning this in, in two big areas, in, in Dharavi and in, um, in Emmys. We're going to create a crazy new formation of uh, collaboration between uh, Nagars and informal settlements and uh, societies that are formed, which are again one-room tenements, and say, what are the things you're going to negotiate with the municipality? What are the things you're going to negotiate with the state? We may not succeed right now, but my experience of the last 40 years says that you have to persist. If you don't persist, the state wins to get away from being responsible. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Shashank, a question for you, right, which was this, you know, with these small businesses shut currently, there would be a rise in more, street, you probably see more rise in street vendors and things like that. So, you know, is this an opportunity to talk about licenses and quotas. And you know, this goes back to the other question that I want to say, is that is this, a, you know, today, you know, in the, in the transport business, we have had this stage carriage, contract carriage restriction for years, which has been very prohibitive. So do you think that uh, now that, you know, anybody is doing delivery and anybody is doing contract, is this an opportunity to, you know, really change some of these archaic laws, a point that Ms. Uh, Salada also made, uh, and, you know, already start doing, because we're already not sort of following those laws. So is this an opportunity to sort of undo some of these laws and allow uh, sort of slightly different forms of governance uh, that can come about around these things? So, so any thoughts? Uh, firstly, I'll, I'll go to the question first about street vendors. Uh, I feel the licensing part is altogether a hoax because in Mumbai, the last uh, licenses that were given were almost 35, uh, 40 years back. And there are no new licenses given till date. Uh, and only 15,000 people have the licenses uh, at, at a time where more than 3 lakh people are hawking. So all this thing of legal and illegal is uh, absolutely not right. Because uh, uh, people take to street vending when they, when they have no jobs. And there are a lot of countries in the world who uh, during the time of recession, they, uh, they encourage people to street vend. They uh, have areas where they can street vend because they feel that if these people earn their livelihood by street vending, uh, that, uh, they, will be not, uh, they will not be a, a burden on the society. So we should have this kind of an approach rather than restricting street vending, we should create an atmosphere where street vending can be done at the same time, people uh, are not inconvenienced. Uh, basically, if uh, you talk about footpaths or things like that, 
both uh, people ha have to have a right to walk as well as people should be allowed to street vent so we uh, we have to find a win win situation and if we do so a uh, crisis like the one we are facing today can be dealt with in a better fashion uh, coming uh, to your thing on uh, the transportation and uh, where we are talking about licenses with uh, uh, state carriage and uh, contract carriage and things like that in recent times especially in last uh, few years we have uh, seen a complete violation and uh, negligent uh, completely vi complete violation of these rules when we take to aggregators even today there are no rules and regulations to tackle with the aggregators so uh, there is nothing in place i feel we need to reconsider everything and uh, i had once uh, because we were not very happy with the things uh, the way things were going so we had told either you control everybody or you decontrol everybody so you have certain rules for certain people and you don't have anything for others so that you have to have a equal playground uh, uh, level playing play, field. Uh, play uh, level playing field for everybody so i feel uh, time has come where we have to reconsider things uh, and because we have laws which are very old and uh, today we are moving at a very fast rate so we we need to uh, come up with something new but uh, w when we are coming up with something new we have to involve all the stakeholders and then come up uh, with something otherwise uh, there will uh, be people who will be uh, left out of all this thanks thanks uh, shashank uh, uh, what one uh, question maybe uh, kelera tanwa you can answer i mean it's basically around this labor protection laws or labor laws and you sort of briefly mentioned i mean uh, you know is there i mean uh, i mean does that get rolled back i mean you know you also mentioned that they are not sufficient uh, so but i mean the fact that you said that it is right now in some parliamentary committee are there still opportunities to you know to influence that given that you know this covid has really raised these issues it was probably a bit hush hush but now it's to the forefront so do you think some kind of a more organized way to to sort of participate in that conversation would would help and any thoughts around that i mean so. you are muted huh? so you will have to unmute uh. okay can you hear me yeah uh, you know a situation like this is bound to create there is a gap there is a clearly a gap and governments are definitely on the back foot there would have to be very quick reaction to what is happening the only fear i have is that it should not become a means to juggle with who will be your voter that can happen political parties state governments and all will look on this either as a means of um, ensuring that people continue to vote here but have the portability of their documents of security in another state that can lead to interstate problems because as we heard uttar pradesh and maharashtra both had said uttar pradesh had said we will not allow migrants to go to another state till we are assured that certain basic threshold of benefits is being made available by that incoming state and the uh, maharashtra had said that they are going to start some process of registering these people who come so that they are able to keep a tap on who is coming from where where are they going kind of thing now this can be the beginning of something wonderful it can be done efficiently quickly it need not you can use the latest ordinary uh, mobile based uh, apps to get this thing done it can be verified uh, uh, randomly so people can't just you know uh, uh, make a fool of the government but if it becomes exploitative and it becomes a means of you pay me my 10% before i do your work for you then it can become another big huge problem i think that governments are on the back foot they will find a way they certainly need that labor to come back they will have to pamper them a little and make them feel good and perhaps they will find some quicker ways of addressing the legal issues 
But having said that, if they pamper the industry all over again and make it difficult for labor to do anything and just treat them as, uh, they are, as though they are animals, and industry is treated as God and allowed to do pretty much what it is by wishing away the labor laws, I think that would be even worse than the situation we are in today. My gut feeling is that something good will come out of it. So, thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, we are over time now, but uh, I think, uh, you know, and you know what, I mean, what Sheila mentioned at the end of her, when she spoke first, that whether it's, you know, in desperation. I mean, I just, you know, one thought that maybe, you know, uh, uh, we as, you know, as, society and other academics can do so just so what is that one thing or two things that you think we should do now uh, or that we can use this sort of this time where you know these challenges about the informal sector the migrants that have come to the fore how can we use this moment to actually change things and make their lives better and sort of you know make the cities actually respect them for what they bring to the city and so just if we can go around the table uh, and, uh, you know, just last parting thoughts around this uh, before we close. Uh, 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 since Professor Kundu, you haven't spoken, why don't you start and then we can speak. Madhav, I thought you said you will give me extra five minutes if I talk about the macro level data. Now, first thing I want to say, do the governments at the state or central level have the adequate data to intervene in a period of crisis as far as the movement of labor is concerned. I think we do have the data. They just don't have the political will to bring the data into public domain and use it for intervention. If the census is conducted in 2011 and the first table of workforce comes out by December 2011, why the migration table comes in middle of 2018, I do not understand. Number two, if the government can put up the data for 2001, district to district movement at the demand of the ministry in 2014-15, and when we ask why don't you release the data for 2011, they said some district boundaries have changed. Of course, they keep on changing. Some adjustment could have been made. So I have a feeling, I mean, I don't want to put it very strongly, there could be some vested interest in really not letting this migration data come into strictly in the public domain because it really helps some vested interest. I just want to ask two questions. Uh, to one is uh, Sheila and Shashank. They talked about the informal sector and the numbers there. And Shailaja Ji rightly pointed out that there is a need for registration and an inclusive registration system. The question that I have. Look at the numbers of domestic help, which are registered, and actual data given by the census is much less. Look at the auto rickshaw drivers, much less. Look at the retailers, and Shashank was uh, rightly mentioning street vendors. The discrepancy is there, which really means all the registration system, this in migrating states imposing their requirements, out migrating states giving their requirements, we do not want this registration system to be exclusionary. They should reflect the reality, and that's why. I personally believe the government should have the political will bring out the data into public domain and use it for effective intervention. The National Sample Survey, PLF, as for example, 2017-18, all that they needed to do is to add one question about migration. We would have got all the data classified by migrant and non-migrant. Health and Education Survey, they could have one question and increase the sample size so that we can get the district level information. All that we need is to pressurize the government to really have the political will to bring the data into public domain and use it for policy intervention. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Shilpa, uh, the thoughts from you, closing thoughts? Yeah, yeah. so I, I think the adjective you know used a lot in this COVID crisis is uh, the adjective saying invisible. And I would say, you know, the one hope I would have is uh, for uh, this set of people to not only be visible, but to also have, uh, you know, like I said, dignity in terms of how they live in the city and therefore the engagement with the city uh, through access to better services. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. You know, we have so much of data apart from what academics do 
the election office has so much data which is down to the last person about which exactly his habitation where he is how many members his family census is somewhat old election data is pretty um, reliable and i do feel that there are so many ways if government wants it can put together so much material which it has in the education sector it has in the health sector it has in the election offices and this can be maybe there'll be 10% mistakes but straight away you can have an enormous amount of data which will be able to put people in two different groups with needing certain different kinds of strategies but you can't have a situation where you don't know who is getting the benefits of security you don't know who is moving where and whether he is covered he goes in search of money he goes exactly the way what is happening with the delhi hospitals uh, i'm not taking the side of kejriwal or anybody else but the fact remains that people from other states swarm to the delhi hospitals and they don't all come for super speciality work they come because there is a feeling that you will be better looked after in delhi than anywhere else but if you do it in a open ended way anybody can do anything because this is a laissez faire kind of a situation then you can never organize and you can never do it in a professional way you have artificial intelligence who have the benefit of um, uh, remote sensing data that doesn't apply to migrants but i'm saying you have so much technology at your disposal so much digitalization it should be more than possible to have your finger on the pulse of every single human being if uh, um, your um, aadhar card has not done it and there's a gap in that that has to be filled but if aadhar is there it's very easy to say who has the ration card who does not who does not has to be put into three or four envelopes and dealt with in terms of what are you going to do for their welfare and their benefits and what will be the liability of government and what will be the liability of the employer i think these are the things that i would like to see happening Right. Sheila, last word to you. You're muted. You're speaking. So, you know, informality and invisibility have become synonymous in the eyes of all policy making, and I think that the role of all of us. is to empower communities to be also able to own and manage data too much data is going in the stratosphere so that nobody can own it except um, academics or people who 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 manage this so one of the things we are doing is we are trying to help communities look at how they can produce data that can be aggregated and disaggregated because the problem is that you don't have granular information when you are dealing with invisible populations you need locational details you need cohorts you need groups most of the data sets that are produced are produced for broad brush policy making and then they are never able to disaggregate them because unless you disaggregate them you cannot reach people so one of the things that we are doing is trying to create ways by which poor people produce that data they aggregate it and then they look at ways by which they use that aggregation for negotiations because the other thing is if some super person does their negotiations then people on the ground don't understand how to do that and people need to get into this process so it's a long haul but i think that that where poor people are concerned it's a slog that has to take place the question is more and more philanthropies more and more international organizations feel more comfortable working with cities and national governments that very carefully evade doing these things so it's a battle and i think it it's a battle that's got to be fought through because that's that's what real politics with the big small p is the recognition doesn't come out of kindness it comes out of uh, 
of, 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 of need and of demonstrating strength and negotiations and knowing what you want. Up, up till now, everything is pushed by this 10,000 rupees. If it came from the, the, the representatives of unions or networks, they, have, they, they know how to deal with that. If it just comes out of somebody saying, okay, go to the bank and get this money. When I told somebody that the banks are going to give loans, they said laughing. They said three-fourth of it will go in trying to either bribe that person or in my taxi fare or in my bus fare. That's the level of cynicism that people have about the state's ability to support you. So there's a much larger issue right now is what is the state? Do people have rights over it or, they, or we just take whatever they give and become so-called self-reliant if nobody gives you something. I mean, that's, that's what COVID has brought out. Who cares for you? To what extent? Only to feed you or to produce a resilience? We are all talking about climate change, resilience, all kinds of big things. But what does it mean to poor people, urban and rural? You know, if, if, if you can't even be assured of meals and a roof over your head, and everything else is meaningless. So I think it's 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 going to it's going to either be like the, once the crisis is over, the doors will quickly close again. The other thing I want to tell you is how much stamina do you have to get all the people you've called? You've called me. You've called Shashank. You've called. Uh, the Omidya Foundation, you've called Professor Kundu. They're all doing very, very different things. What about actually bringing us back so that we also learn from each other? Because we work in very different spaces. So that's a challenge well, back to you, Madhav. No, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Shira. And I think, uh, no, no, I, I, and thank you everyone for, for your perspective. I mean, I think broadly, two or three things, you know, did come out, I think, finding the right ways in which information about the sector, about these invisible people can be created so that it is not exploitative, but used in the right ways to assist or help uh, them get back to their lives. I think there is a, I think, a whole conversation on the fact that, you know, they need to organize the communities and we need to find ways in which we can bring money directly to these communities rather than being stuck in some sort of government body. So is there a way to directly give money to the communities, et cetera, to be able to then, you know, through their own self-governance forms, use it uh, to, to sort of build back better as, as, as is being said. And I think, uh, and I think this idea of sort of, uh, and then the laws, I mean, I think the several laws, which, you know, all have been used in this context, you know, starting from the 18, whatever, under yeah. law of plague, to the you know so you know we're, we're dealing with sort of really archaic laws and if there is a way in which uh, you know a lot of these can be uh, you know brought to the fore and you know ways in which how they can be systematically influenced uh, so that you know as we move forward they reflect the 21st century urbanization reality as you mentioned Sheila uh, and yeah. and that we can sort of so I think Broadly, I think these three things have emerged. I mean, it is very clear that we have to create, as you were saying, very, very new forms of coalitions and partnerships uh, to sort of come up with more innovative ways of sort of addressing addressing these things. And and uh, certainly, I mean, I, uh, I mean, stamina is a question and uh, you have uh, challenges. So we will think about ways in which we can we can we can at least move or at least participate uh, as much as we can in in other such coalitions etc where we can bring some of our expertise and ideas uh, to the fore but thanks again everyone for your for your contribution for your participation and thank you to all of our participants uh, for staying with us hopefully this is the beginning of a new conversation and uh, we will be able to continue it and probably do much more specific uh, conversations around specific topics with more sort of concrete sort of ideas and outcomes. So, so thank you everyone. Uh, uh, and again, thank you very much to all of our speakers and thanks to all of the participants and we'll stay in touch. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mother. Thank you.